Thank you for joining us online. My name is Sam, and I'm one of the pastors here at CSCC. If this is one of your first times joining us, we are so glad you're here watching. There is a connect button on top of our website, cscc.ca, located near the top of our homepage. If you click that and fill out the form, we'll be sure to get you connected into our church family. Also, if you like what you hear this morning, hit the like button or leave us a comment. Today, Pastor Phil will be sharing the message with us. But before that, let's join together in singing. Paints a canvas with a million stars. 
Thank you for worshiping with us. Hey, high school youth camp is happening this week at Nanus Bay. Please be praying for our staff and volunteers for strength and wisdom as they lead. Pray for youth who are attending that they will experience the love of Jesus. Please pray for safe travels to and from Nanus Bay too. I'm so thankful to be part of a such generous church community. Your generosity is helping spread Jesus' love and hope as well as meeting various needs in our church communities. When we give, we express our love for God. And our giving is an act of worship. You can always give online at crcc.ca slash give. Here's Pastor Phil with today's message. Hello, friends. So glad to be here with you. You know, a special shout out to uh, our Elder Grove family. It's awesome that we get to worship together. And we've been going through a series, The Truth About Lies. And today we're kind of going to bring that to a conclusion. We're going to wrap it up. And to do that, we're going to jump into a letter written by James, Jesus' half-brother. So we're going to jump right into it. We're going to pick this up in chapter four, where James asks his listeners, what is causing quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires? Now the English, the ESV translate this as, don't they come from the passions at war within you? What you want, you don't have, so you scheme and you kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it, so you fight and you wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want what will give you pleasure. Now, this message is kind of an end game for us. We've talked through how Satan initiates a lie and then how the flesh acts on that desire to then have that desire become normalized and become a, a normal idea, an ideology within the world. And now we find ourselves kind of trapped by the lies of the enemy. And James diagnoses this problem to his followers in his own words. He says, your passions are at war within you. Our passions are at war within us. Now we see in the New Testament writings kind of the struggle between the flesh and the spirit, right? So this word passion was used a lot by an African scholar named uh, St. Augustine who described passions simply as, you know, emotions and desires that have overcome our wills. And for him, it had kind of this negative connotation that is a little unfamiliar to us. So we usually associate passion as a good thing. But I think we also realize where passion can have its limits. If someone is all sizzle and no steak, we, we recognize that that's a problem. And so Augustine paints a good word concept for us. You know, here's an example. What's the start of most of our fights? I remember when I was a teenager, I wanted to go to my friend's house. So I asked my parents if I could go have a sleepover at my friend's. Now, I had an ulterior motive. 
It was at my friend's house that I could get away with stuff that, you know, wasn't allowed. Stuff that I had no, there was no way it was going to be allowed in my house, but I could get away with it at my friend's house. But on this occasion, my parents refused my request. How dare they? How dare they? In fact, I became so upset that I stormed up to my room and I punched a hole in my wall. You desire what you do not have, so you kill to get it. You know, on this occasion, all I killed was my knuckles and a little bit of drywall. And I didn't end up getting my way that time, but I think we can all relate to this conflict within us. You know, that bubbling up of emotion. You know, when you really want something, you know, what are you willing to do to get it? When you see what other people have, how does it make you feel and act? Or when things don't go your way, how are you going to respond? When our passion, that like bubbling up of emotion, we want, we desire, when it overcomes our reason, we can do all sorts of things to try and get our way or react poorly when we don't get our way. This unchecked, misplaced passion releases the war within us out into the world. And James is calling this behavior, this misplaced passion, this war within us. He's calling out this behavior in the community of faith. He's pastoring. And this is just as relevant to you and me today as it was to James' community all those years ago. And so I think at this point, we can begin to ask the question, what do we want? We have this war within us. We have to ask ourselves, what do we want? Do we want well? Do we want poorly? And, and how can we know whether what we want is good or bad. Now, C.S. Lewis said something like this, and, and he was a, a really popular author and scholar. He said something like this, wickedness, wickedness, when you examine it, turns out to be the pursuit of goodness in the wrong way. I'm going to say that again. This is really big. Wickedness turns out to be the pursuit of goodness in the wrong way. You know, C.S. Lewis suggests that pleasure, money, power, safety, you know, all those things as far as they go are, are good things and we should want them. The badness consists of pursuing them by the wrong method or in the wrong way or by having too much. And I'll ask you guys, what's something good that turns out to be a hassle? When used wrongly, turns out to be a hassle. You know, for me, when I was a young adult, I used to collect uh, Blu-rays and DVDs. You remember those? You know, those things that, you know, those discs that you put into devices? You know, I had this whole binder, super thick, that I'd just collect them. I'd, I'd bulk buy them from Walmart. And in fact, I bought them at such a rapid play, pace that I couldn't even watch the movies before I bought more. I had all these unwatched movies that I owned. You know, I had this compulsion that I didn't want to miss out on any good movie. I had to have it. But that compulsion, it was an unchecked passion. And it turns something good, a love of movies, into something bad. You know, when we're in control of our desires, it is great. But when they control us, it's awful. Now, we all want love and belonging and wholeness. Uh, we want things like blessing, a, a health, a good relationship. You know, these are common to us, and they are good desires. But good desires become misplaced desires or unchecked passion when we try to get them our own way. Our passion... That bubbling up of emotion, that desire, it overcomes our will and controls us. I think Eugene Peterson translates this really well in an interesting way. He calls his listeners like, you're spoiled children. You're spoiled children, each wanting your own way. This, this warring within us causing fights. So maybe instead of asking what we want, you know, we should ask, do we want what God wants? Do we want what God wants? James, I think, is trying to remind his listeners of what is most important, and that is our relationship with God, who is the source of all goodness. But when we desire wrongly, that misplaced passion manifests in, in conflict, in fighting, in betrayal, in sin. You know, in contrast, Jesus built his life around doing the will of the Father. His will, his passions were always in check. James is recognizing the ways in which you know, our wills are not strong enough to combat our passions on their own and how that hurts the community of faith and how it hurts the world around us. Our attempts at goodness have turned into wickedness. And so it's in this place with our passions kind of warring within us that James makes very plain, you know, the results 
the fallout of believing the lies and succumbing to our passions and our desires and where it gets us. James uses a really harsh word. He says in uh, verse four, you adulterers. Now, before we freak out, in, in, in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, adultery is, is a word used to mean idolatry. They're not saying that the Israelites are actually sleeping around, but it's a form of adultery. James continues, do you realize that friendship with the world is enmity with God? He says it again, if you want to be a friend of the world, you make yourself an enemy of God. Do you think the scriptures have no meaning? They say that God is passionate and that the spirit he has placed within us should be faithful to him. So we have this Old Testament imagery, adulterers. We just talked about the misplaced passions of man, and now we have to reconcile that with the holy, faithful passion of God. And so again, if we want to do a broad reading of the Old Testament, maybe you're watching this and you're listening and you feel like, oh, I feel like a bad spouse. I suggest you read the Bible for a pick-me-up because the picture of the relationship between God and Israel is that of like a marriage covenant. And we read again and again that the people of Israel fall for the lie of the enemy. They abandon faithfulness to God to find wealth and prosperity. The Bible says they chase other gods or they try to be like other nations. And scripture uses this adultery metaphor to talk about their idolatry. You know, Hosea paints this picture vividly, the prophet, that Israel has given themselves away and have been unfaithful. And it makes me think about how often we abandon what we know is good for what feels good. I bring that up to say what I think James is saying. Our sin is a big deal to God. This is one of the greatest tragedies of the lies of the enemy, this idea that our sin is not that serious, that it's not a big deal. So what? Just a little bit of sin, just a little bit of sex, just a little bit of lies. But the reality is is that when we're seduced by sin, a death occurs, a separation occurs. It trades the, the permanent goodness of God for a shadow of the real thing. Jesus said it like this, we gain the world, but lose our soul. You know, James is telling us that these misplaced passions are putting us at odds with a holy God. God is saying in, in, in no uncertain terms that it's all or it's nothing. It reminds me when I was a, a teen, I would zealously cheer for my favorite athletes. And when you're young, you can't just be a fan of the game. You have to pick sides. You know, you couldn't be a Kobe fan and a LeBron fan. You couldn't like Peyton Manning and Tom Brady. You know, I couldn't like both Crosby and Ovechkin. I I chose Ovechkin. And you had to pick. God in the world, you have to pick. Now, this is a tough approach to take because we live in a culture that typically equates like love with acceptance. And there's this idea that like all beliefs, all ideas, they're all equal and they all create something bigger. But Christianity is not Jesus and These worldly ideas, these secular ideas opposed to the ways of God, they're in combat with the will of God and they make us enemies of God. So when we talk about God's passion or maybe depending on your translation, God's jealousy, we're really making a statement about his holiness. God is saying that I'm the only one worth following. I am the only source of beauty. I am the way, the truth, and the life. You know, don't abandon what is good for what feels good because when you do, you push me away. And even in this, God is merciful to us. Look at the scriptures. When you approach God, whether it was in the mountain or in the temple, wherever, you had to come correct because our sin is a death sentence in the holy presence of God. To befriend the world and the lies of the enemy is to push away the love and presence of the Father. And so James asks, do you think the scriptures have no meaning? Do you think Like, are are you guys serious about this? Let's remember that James isn't talking to, you know, random people. He's calling out Jesus' followers who are, as James sees it, repeating the mistakes of generations past. How often can we look in our lives and we see repeating what people have done before us, repeating the same mistake, buying into the lie, our misplaced passions and our desires steer us away from our relationship with God. God is the source of all goodness and eternal life. Don't abandon what you know is good 
for what feels good. Don't give up the eternal for something that is temporary and immediate. And to do that, it seems that we need a higher will than our own. If we want to resist the lies of the devil, if we want to break free, it seems like we're going to need a humble resistance. James goes on to say in chapter 4, and he gives grace more generously. I love the way, again, the ESV puts this. It says, but he gives more grace. He gives more grace. As the scriptures say, God uh, opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So humble yourselves before God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come close to God and God will come close to you. James continues in the posture that we should take. He says, wash your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts for your loyalty, like we talked about, is divided between God and the world. And our response is that there should be tears for what you have done. There should be sorrow and grief, sadness instead of laughter, gloom instead of joy. So again, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up in honor. Now, This sounds heavy to us, but this is actually extremely good news. God creates a pathway back to wholeness and back to love for everyone who has fallen to the lies of the enemy, for everyone who says, I'm not good enough, for everyone who says, I can't make it back. God says that where sin abounds, grace abounds more. That's awesome. Where sin abounds, grace abounds more. Perhaps you've been in a situation where your loyalty was divided between your friends or or, or coworkers. How often our interactions today, whether it is in person or in digital spaces, do we find grace or forgiveness for being wrong or for saying something that people disagree with? It's in short supply, isn't it? You know, in fact, we're often quick to break ties when someone offends us, says something that we don't like, and we don't give them another chance. But God is not like that. He offers more grace. If our pride is our own will, getting our own way, then humility is getting to the place where we want what God wants. And that humility allows us to will what God wills. Now, I think I need to frame humility a little bit. And for for our purposes, humility is continually touching base with God. It's not about how long we pray or how Loud we pray, but how often we pray. You know, I might not be flashy on Valentine's Day, but I'm consistent for all 365 out there. Is there anyone else out there like me? Being close with God goes hand in hand to resisting the devil. What this tells me is that it isn't about our own willpower. We're not going to resist him on our own, but our proximity to God that supplies us the power that we need to resist and to send the devil running. This is the work of the Spirit in us. It's a little bit like this. It's hard to eat healthy when your cupboards are full of chips and cookies. You know what I mean? When you know it's in your pantry, you know it's in that like top upper right hand corner where the kids can't reach, you know it's hard to resist. But when your kitchen is stacked with healthy options, it becomes easier to do that. It becomes easier to resist the things that will do your body harm. Humility, being close to God, is this conscious choosing of what you allow into your pantry, of what you allow into your life. Drawing close to God is choosing moment by moment. I'm going to lay myself down before the Lord. And that's how we resist the devil. It's not our willpower, but our closeness to God that allows us to want what God wants. Now, humbling ourselves in this way can come with sadness and gloom. And it's not because the Christian faith is inherently sad and dour and stoic and joyless, but because it's painful to admit that we are wrong. And this is the pain of repentance. You know, typically I think that I'm always right and that my ideas are awesome. You know, I don't want to deal with my shortcomings though. You know, I don't want to deal with the things that I've said wrong and done. That's, that's hard. That makes me vulnerable and it's raw and it's painful. But going through this inner conflict of of laying our life down, of of drawing ourselves close to the Father, this is how we put our desires in their place. This is how we fill our pantry with good things. It's knowing that it's not enough. It's knowing that I've done wrong. It's the ability to clean out our house being like, I know this doesn't look awesome, but I give it to you. 
And the promise is this, when we do this, that as we give our lives back to God, God brings us back to life. That as we give our lives to God, that God brings us back to life. And this is how we're gonna break free of the lies of the enemy. We're gonna close our, our sermon with a prayer. And this prayer is Psalm 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and uphold me with a willing spirit. Thank you, Lord, for exposing the lies of the enemy and opening yourself back up to us through Jesus Christ. Our question of the day is this. Are there unchecked desires in your life that need to be brought close to God and put under his will? Let's reflect on that together. They say um, if the pathway that James is suggesting is a, is a humble pathway, humility is something often that we can internalize, that we can make kind of just in our brains and it's something that is personal and, and silent and it's something that just goes on inside of us. But it's actually so much easier when we get a little help. Scripture talks about confession. You know, maybe you've been trapped in a lie that you can't escape on your own. You can't seem to escape the cycle of desire and regret, passion and pain. And maybe you need to bring someone else into your journey to keep you on the right path. You know, the next chapter in James talks about people laying hands on us for healing and, and, and for the forgiveness of sins. And this can be a really good practice. When we can be honest and accountable to a friend, we will have a better time being honest with God. And when we can be honest with God, we be open to him to receive his goodness in our lives. And we get to resist the devil hand in hand together as we submit to the Lord. Let's read our doxology together. Romans chapter 11. Oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. How in unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable are his ways. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. Take care, friends. Thank you for tuning in for today's service. Please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. We would love to hear from you and help you get connected. We are one church in multiple locations. Our Alder Grove campus meets at Alder Grove Community Secondary School at every Sunday at 10.30 a.m. Our Abbotsford campus has three services each Sunday, 8.30, 10, and 11.30 a.m. We'd love to see you at one of our gatherings. Stay in touch throughout the week. Follow us on Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. Search CSCC Church to find us. We hope this service gave you a glimpse into our community. We'd love for you to be part of it. Hope to see you next week. God bless you.